Let's welcome Pastor Chris Chan to give the word today. Good morning, Charisma. And uh, on behalf of the leadership of Charisma, we want to wish all the mothers here and online a happy Mother's Day. Before I begin my uh, sharing today, I would like to play a video to, uh, to encourage. It's a little humorous, but a lot of truth in it. Uh, enjoy. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! Ah! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Well, mothers, <laughs> don't you wish, ladies, that you can say some of the things that were said, that you have so much time at home, you don't know what to do, or you can sleep in, or your, or especially this, I like this, like, your teenage children are so attentive that you don't have to repeat yourself, they will listen, or help you with your chores, like laundry or throwing trash, right? Uh, not in our dreams. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but today, we want to honor all the mothers because we know how much you sacrifice. And oftentimes, you are really underappreciated. You don't get paid for. Many uh, an ins insensitive husband would come back from uh, days of hard work and come back, dinner's not ready, house is in a mess, and ask his wife, what did you do the whole day? <laughs> As though that, hey, you, you just do nothing. Right? But today, I want to <clears throat> share with you the power of a mother's influence. Now notice I didn't say godly influence, but just influence. Because influence goes both ways. It can be positive, it can be negative. Now I have asked Turt, uh, Turt, can you display a verse that I, I forgot to put in? It's in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 5. That, yeah, that captivates this. So haven't been reminded of the un, well, how do you pronounce it? Un, unfeigned faith or sincere faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy, wow, this is King James, no one is so hard to read. Uh, first in thy grandmother, Lois, and then in thy mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded in you also. Let me read to you a simpler version, um, the Message Bible. That precious memory triggers another, your honest faith. And what a rich faith it is handed down from your grandmother, Lois, to your mother, Eunice, and now to you. Notice the word handed down. You can hand down a lot of things. There is a story <clears throat> under cultural training or cultural transfers where one generation transfers to another. It talks about uh, a man notices his wife that every time she cooks ham, she will 
cut both ends of the ham. So one day the husband was curious and said, now wh why did you cut away the, the ends? Because they are good ham, you can still eat. Why do you cut? And she said, I don't know. I learned it from my mother. So she decided to ask her mother, mom, I know that when you cook ham, and I learned it from you, you always cut the ends of the ham. Why was it so? And she said, I don't know. I learned it from your, my mother, your grandmother. <laughs> and then she said, okay, I'm going to ask grandma, except she is passed. She has passed for a few years now. So she said, maybe I'll ask grand, grandpa. So she called and asked, grandpa, uh, I noticed growing up, uh, grandma, when she cooked the ham, she will cut both ends. And why is it so? So grandpa thought for a moment and said, oh, well, we cut the ham. She cut the ham so that it will fit in her frying pan <laughs> because it's too small. Now, so that, that style, that recipe or whatever it is was passed on from one generation to another, good or bad, indifferent, but it was passed down. And after a while, they just do it because grandma used to do it and that's what my mom did and then I did it. So it's passed down. So the Bible says, in, uh, according to Paul writing to Timothy, like your grandmother Lois, her great faith, her sincere faith was passed down to your mother and now lives in you. Now, Timothy had a... Uh, I don't know, non-believing father is a Greek father. So don't know whether he's in the faith. But for sure, the woman's sides are very powerful. Now today, you have, a, you have the responsibility and the privilege to pass down something godly that will last for many generations. Uh, some of your grandmothers, you can still do that to your grandchildren, or to your children and to their children and on and on. Right? Mom, what will we be had they not been around? Don't you agree? I grew up without a father because my father died when I was five years old, and my mother was basically my father and mother. So I learned a lot of things from her, and I, I, today I can tell that I am what I am. It's really by my mother's upbringing. Now, she, she was a non-believer all her years, but the, the attitude, the, the hard working, the ethics of life that she passed on to me. So today I want to talk about the influence of a mother. Now, bad influence can pass down too. I was just thinking about Jacob. The Bible, Jacob in the Old Testament, he was a conniving, a con man, accomplished con, con man, right? Now, where do you think he got all this? Obviously, he inherited from his mother, but not only that, but the mother, right? The mother taught the son how to cheat the father. I mean, talk about drama. That would make a good, you know, soap opera drama. Mother teaching the son to deceive you know, husband and father. So, Jacob, no doubt, inherited the genes, but also learned from the mother how to deceive people, how to cheat, and perfected it to the nth degree. Uh, and uh, Rachel came from that kind of family too because we know Rachel's brother, Laban, was also very conniving, right? So, so bad things can pass down from one generation to another as well. So we need to be very careful. So my encouragement to you is that we will pass down good, godly legacy so that it will go on for many generations. Now, <clears throat> The Ladies' Home Journal, years ago, now this was a 130-year-old magazine that got defunct in 2014, I think. But sometime uh, in the past, it ran a, a survey. What would you most like to see first in heaven? That was a question. What who, sorry, who would you most like to see first in heaven? Now, the answer will be a little surprising because obviously it's Jesus, right? I mean, when we get to heaven, obviously we want to first see Jesus. But then think for a moment, will we really see Jesus? I don't know because Jesus has billions of people in heaven. He's so, so busy, right? Uh, chances are he might, but if he doesn't, I can understand. Just like if you attend uh, a, a dignitary birthday, whether the, the governor's birthday or, or somebody important or the president, so when you show up, do you think the president there will be there to greet you? Chances are not, right? Maybe you get to see him later. But so, so this is, these are the answers. 31% said mother. Wow, 31%. Now how about father? Guess how many percent? Half of that, 16%. So that is very sad, right? Uh, so you see, you see how much influence you have, mothers, you know, on your children. They say mother first and then father. And then the sad thing is that the next uh, statistics tells spouse. People will say, I would expect to see my spouse first, right? If, if she dies early before me. But only 10% says they will meet their spouse 10%. And I thought, something is wrong, right? Uh, now, 
I, I don't know the reason why they said they expect to see the mother first, father, and then spouse. It should be the other way around, right? Spouse, mother, and father. So maybe they ask the question differently, or I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not here to talk about spouses today. I'm talking about mothers. So I, I'm spared of that, that dilemma as to why the statistics are such. But anyway, today I want to pay tribute to God, a mother's godly influence, the positive one. All these famous people, the late Billy Graham. He said, only God himself fully appreciates the influence of a Christian mother in the molding of character in her children. Billy Graham. So I'm sure that his spirituality, the man who has impacted Christianity and, and, and you know, preaching to all nations. I mean, literally, he has gone to all nations of the world to preach. Surely owes that, that legacy from his mother. His mother has a great uh, uh, say and, and impartation in that. And then there will be the George Washington, the founder of, of America, the first president. He said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. Now imagine if Pastor James were to say that, right? I'm sure the wife would be a little jealous. Don't you like, I mean, Mrs. George Washington would be a little uh, jealous, but that's what it is. That's why he said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. Wow. Josh Washington, a great leader, right? All to that development, the secret. Now, I want to say, behind every great man, there is a? There's a woman, right? And you could be that woman to raise up godly people, great leaders. Abraham Lincoln, a great president. I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. All that I am or ever hoped to be, I owe to my angel mother. Wow. Abraham Lincoln, right? Uh, free slaves and <clears throat> emancipator. And then uh, Thomas Edison, the great inventor. It was at critical times in my life that my mother believed in me, and because of her faith in me, I became a great inventor. So, Today, we enjoy all these new inventions, the, the, light, the light and everything that Thomas Edison ever created. We have to thank his mother, right? Had the mother not encouraged him, these inventions may not come about. Mothers always believe the best, well, generally speaking, in their children. I once interviewed uh, on TV some mother. His son has just committed a, a great crime. Many people are killed. And she said, and then she said this, Basically, my son is a good man. I said, oh, really? I mean, he does done a, cre a heinous crime and has killed people and, and just still believe, the mother still believe. Basically, my son is still a good person. Wow, that's, that's an incredible faith, right? When the whole world wants to condemn him, the mother says, my son basically is a good man. <clears throat> Tributes to mother by Charles Stanley, a famous pastor from Atlanta. Motherhood is a great honor and privilege, yet it is also synonymous with servanthood. Every day, women are called upon to selflessly meet the needs of their families, whether they are awake at night nursing a baby, spending their time and money on less than grateful teenagers. Uh, I'm, I'm learning that of two teenagers. And preparing meals, moms continuously put others before themselves. Isn't that true? Uh, my mother, I, I kind of asked my mother because... She became a widow at a very young age, maybe late 30s. My father died young. And I asked, I said, Mom, why, why didn't you remarry? And she just laughed. I said, oh, nobody, nobody wanted me. But I knew that my mother is not bad looking, right? And, uh, and she could have married, remarried if she wanted to. Uh, but I know deep in my heart, she wanted to devote her life to raise up three children on her own and, and just pick it upon herself to sacrifice her life for for all of us, which I'm very, very thankful. Now, so it is a job, not a job, a responsibility that God has given unto you. And a lot of times you don't get a lot of thanks, right? Uh, especially teenage children, right? No matter what you cook, like my, my, my kids, gosh. Eh? Like, because when I grew up, I have very little. So whatever food that is given to me, well, I just gobble up. But my, not my sons. My sons don't eat leftovers. I said, wow. My parents will flip from the grave knowing that you don't eat leftovers. I mean, like, we will, we will just eat anything on the table. And then when you see on the table, they don't like, they don't want to eat. I said, wow. Uh, but that's the, this generation, right? Now, today I want to encourage you 
from the story of Hannah. Now, I'm sure you have heard many sermons about Hannah, but today I want to give you a certain perspective about her that will encourage you, right? Just, just listen up. And by the way, whatever you say to your children are very important. Like Thomas Edison encouraged, uh, was encouraged by his own mother because whatever comes out from your lips can be a curse or a blessing. Now, you, you don't really believe it. Sometimes when we get angry, we say all kinds of things to our children, right? Uh, we say, you're stupid, you're dumb, and on and on and on. I hope we can control ourselves and not say that because some words are binding. I have in counsel many young people uh, when they get married, and, and it came out in the counseling that some of them still remember what their mom said to them, uh, or the grandma, for the simple. There's some that grandma controls, the matriarch of the family would say, and, uh, and things are not good. And then one woman in particular on the way to the third divorce, and I said, why, why is your life so, so unkind to you, so painful? Why is it so? And then, oh, obviously there's a lot of reasons. But you say, I remember when I was a teenager growing up, I was very hot, a uh, very rebellious girl. And I caused a lot of pain to my mother, to which many times she would say this. She said, I bet you will not be happily married. I said, wow, that's a curse over you that you need to break. No wonder you experience that. Now, obviously, it's a character problem, but the fact that the mom said, you will not be happily married, that's a curse that comes upon. So a lot of times, our parents say a lot of things to us that maybe you ask them, I don't remember saying that. Maybe they do, but they just, I don't really mean it, right? But words are words, right? They will grip onto the lives of your children. It will shape them forever, good or bad. So hopefully we will all learn to control our tongue and say only blessings and not just say it as it is or say it like what we feel. Okay, now, Hannah, the reason why I chose Hannah was because she was a very ordinary woman. If she will show up today at church or show us up at your party, probably you will not notice her because there is nothing distinctive about her in the natural. The Bible did not ascribe any, any uh, great beauty unlike Sarah, or Esther of the Bible. The Bible did not ascribe great ability, like she's very capable, unlike Abigail, one of the wives of David, where she was just so, so quick you know, to respond and, and orchestrate things. And she was certainly not ascribed with great wealth or, or come from a noble family. Now, had she had been rich or came from a noble family, she would have a maid that came along with the marriage. And then she will offer her maid as a surrogate mother in, in the later years. Instead of the husband has to take a second wife. So she, she really, like many of us, just ordinary housewife called Mrs. Alcana. That's the husband's name. Nothing special. But what distinguished her from everybody else was her character. She has excellent spirit, so to speak. And you can develop that spirit by the grace of God to be like her. <clears throat> now, so... Handicap, uh, Tana has a handicap in life. One handicap that just caused so much pain and misery. Maybe today you have a handicap. Most of us are born with a handicap, perhaps. But sometimes that handicap causes so much pain and misery like Hannah. Now, when Hannah... Just like any young couples, they get married, they have a lot of aspirations to, to build a beautiful family and live happily ever, ever after, so to speak. And it happened to her because she married a very loving husband that loved her very much. You can tell from the rest of the narrative that the husband will give her double portion on top of everybody else. So that tells us that he was very devoted to her. Unfortunately, after a few years into the marriage, there was a problem. Hannah could not conceive. She was barren, in other words. Now, in this day and age, barrenness or infertility is not a big problem because usually it's medical. Usually, usually there's some medical problems. And, and oftentimes, infertility is not necessarily the wife's fault. It could be the husband, right? Or maybe low sperm count and, and we have to do something about it. But back in those days, if you're inf infertile, you could not conceive. It's always the wife's fault. And not, But not only... <clears throat> not having children, it's not just a personal thing. Now, in the society, you are seen as being cursed, or cursed by God. Because the Bible says <clears throat> in, in the book of Psalms 
The children are a blessing from the Lord, a reward from Him, a reward. So if you don't have any children, if you're married, then that means you don't have a reward from God. So in other words, God is punishing you. And oftentimes, Bible, the Bible says they close the womb of people as divine judgment. Now, uh, for instance, in Abraham's time, Abimelech took Sarah to be his concubine. And actually, it was Abraham's fault because Abraham said, she's my sister. But in rendering divine judgment, the Bible says God closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech as a divine judgment. And Michael, the wife of the first wife of David, she despised David for dancing before the Lord, rejoicing before the Lord. And she even said that sarcastically after what David has done and said, how you have distinguished yourself, you have humiliated yourself by dancing naked. Well, in her mind, naked means like a king should be wearing a royal robe. You didn't wear the royal robe, just whatever under inner garment and then just dancing before the slave girls, just like any vulgar man would do. And because of that, the Bible says, Micah, the Micah, yeah, Michael died or to the dying day, she was childless. And every Hebrew mind, when they read the scriptures, they know this is divine judgment for not having children because of her bad attitude. Now, <clears throat> so you have to understand, it's a very shameful thing. Even all the way to the New Testament in Jesus' time, when Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, uh, was barren for a long time. But after she was, <clears throat> she was pregnant and gave birth to John the Baptist, she said, God has taken away my disgrace. Not only shameful, but a disgrace. So you can imagine the pain that she would go through uh, all her life because of one handicap. There was a certain man from the hill country of uh, Ephraim whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives, one called Hannah and the other Penina. So you can tell that Hannah was the first wife, right? It's always the first wife that mentioned and then followed by the second wife. Penina had children, but, now that but is a very painful but, right? Hannah had none. And that was her misery. Only one handicap. Year after year, this man went up from his home, his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, which were really bad and evil priests, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for El Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. Now, you can tell that the husband was a good man, very committed to the Lord. Every year, he would go out and perform his religious obligation to, to sacrifice, never missed, every year. A good man, a loving man, but yet circumstances has forced him to, 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 to divide his heart between two wives. And that is not the ideal situation, but circumstances force that. And Hannah, every time she has, she looked at the second wife and see all the children, guess what? There is the guilt of condemnation, right? He says, it's your fault. You couldn't produce any children and that's why you have such a messed up family and that's why you're enduring. Can you imagine like, it's, it's really not her fault, right? I mean, like, did I choose to be barren? But the worst of it is, okay, next slide. Who was responsible for her handicap and misery? But to Hannah, Elkanah would give a double portion. See how he loved her, even in spite of the fact that she doesn't produce any children. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. I underline that. See, sometimes we always try to apologize for God. When bad things happen, we say, oh, God just allow this to happen. It's not from God. Especially when we are sick, right? I know sickness is not from God. We try to apologize as though, you know, really... God didn't really want you to have that, but he allowed it as a second choice. God had no choice but to give it to you, but not really. In this instance, this handicap that she had came from God. God did this. In case you missed it, he repeats again the author. And her rival, the second wife, also provoked her severely, not only provoked her severely, to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Second time, just in case you missed it, God is behind this handicap. Now, I said, all of us have handicaps. Not all of us. Some of you are so blessed. Maybe you don't have a handicap. But most of us had a handicap, right? The question is, how do we handle the handicap? And worst of all, your handicap is God's making. Now, that makes it hard to swallow, right? You think maybe the devil is behind it, but God allows it. Okay, we always blame the devil. 
But this is not a devil. It has nothing to do with the devil. It's God himself doing this. Now, how are you going to handle this? It's, it's tough. Now, the Bible says not only that, this went on year after year. Now, that tells us a little bit about Hannah. Hannah is definitely not Sarah. Sarah will have nothing to do with it. Remember what? The Egyptian maid tried to despise her. Hey, you leave my house, my way or the highway, right? But not, Hannah could have done this. But she didn't, the Bible said she didn't even fight back. That tells us what kind of a person, right? Not a confronting, a contentious woman, very submissive, God-honoring. And, and year after year, whenever Hannah went up to the house of God, everybody is rejoicing and celebrating, but she cried in misery alone. Her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Wow, how sad. In the house of the Lord, where everybody celebrated and dancing and rejoicing the Lord, and she is crying in the corner where nobody could understand. Nobody. Not even the husband. In fact, the husband, you know, like, man, is so insensitive, came to ask Hannah and says, Hannah, why are you so sad? Why are you not eating? Like, duh, get a clue. You know, I mean, all these years, your wife has been crying in the dark, and you just say, why are you crying? And he even dared to say this, am I not better than 10 sons? If I'm Hannah, I says, really? You think you are worth that much, right? But Hannah is a kind person. I mean, she didn't argue back. She just kept quiet. But I thought, here was Elkanah. had no clue what Hannah was going through all this while, year after year. And she just asked this insensitive question, right? Why are you crying, honey? It's like, come on. You didn't know all this? This is not the first time, year after year. So here was Hannah bearing all this burden. Why? Because she was barren. Now, had she been given the opportunity even to bear one child, this will all go away, right? But she had this messed up, broken family, complicated family, all because she was barren. Now, handicap. You and I have handicap. The question is this. How do we hand handle the handicaps in our life? I'm likened to what people normally say being dealt a bad hand in life. Life is like a game of poker, right? Where that is your, the hand that you get. You don't get to choose. Sometimes you get a good hand, sometimes you get a bad hand, but whatever hand that you are dealt with, that's the game that you have to play. Or some of you have a good hand that you already dealt with but been taken away. I remember I preached about my background. My handicap was poor. We, we live in poverty. And some lady here in Charisma came to me and said, this is it. Oh, Pastor Chris, your life is just like my life, except I was rich and you were poor. I said, oh yeah, thank you for reminding me. That's what she said, right? Because she has a lot of servants you know, back in the Philippines and all that, but something happened and she lost it all. So, so you could be born with a silver spoon, but something happened, an economic crisis or a bad business deal, or whatever, you lost everything. So a good hand that you had, but was taken away. So what, what was it? A physical or emotional handicap? Maybe physically, you wish that you were not handicapped, but you are. And it can be very painful. Maybe you are an object of people's ridicule. Sometimes kids are very, very uh, unkind, right? I, I used to have a, a church member, one of my leaders. Uh, he walked with a limp because when he was young, he had polio or something, and the doctor did something wrong, and he, he walked with a limp. And people call him Kanchil. Kanchil is like a deer, right? He walks like a deer. I mean, it's like, wow. I, I told the people and says, you all laugh because you make fun of other people. Can you imagine if you are the, the butt of the joke, how, how it feels? So maybe physical handicap will cause you to be a ridicule among other people, just like Hannah, right? Hannah was, was shameful. She was being disgraced. People gossip a lot about her. Financial setback. I, I came from a poor family. I thought, had I, I always ask, life is so unfair before I came to know the Lord. I was born into a poor family. I don't have a lot in my upbringing, I, I got my first bicycle, bicycle, not even a motorcycle, not, let alone a car. We never owned a car, our family, ever. Until I come to America, I bought my own second-hand car for the first time in my life. So I got my first bicycle at the age of 12. Can you imagine? 12? Bicycle. And that is because my mother got a small inheritance from her family, and she was left out of the will because she was born late. And the will was already made, and all her brothers and sisters got everything, and she got a small little token. I got my first watch, or wrist watch. Now today, people don't care to wear a watch because they have a cell phone and all that, but in those days, it's a big deal. I got my first watch at the age of 10. So you imagine, like, I was deprived of a lot of things, and I thought, and I knew one thing. 
All my classmates came from very, very wealthy family. And I know when they graduate from high school, they are going to go overseas. So back in Malaysia, it was a dream of every student to go overseas. And for us, United Kingdom or Australia, because we were a British colony, and some to, to America. And I know for me, <laughs> best of luck, no. There, there will be no such luck. I, I, I couldn't even afford anything. But God was faithful. I got a scholarship. God gave me a scholarship to come to America to study. But the point is that I felt like my financial setback was I was poor. I couldn't do a lot of things. Didn't have a lot of toys to play with growing up and handicapped. Now, maybe you felt like you have born to a, a better family or you have more. Maybe you will be different today. Or you're raised by abusive parents. Sometimes when people talk how good their father or mother is, maybe deep inside you cry and say, I wish I have that kind of parents, but I don't. But whatever it is, or lack of talent. I always wish, because I was a, an introvert, I was afraid to meet up with people. I felt rejected. Now, that's another story, because my mother tried an abortion when I was pregnant due to her old age, but then I was born nonetheless. So I have the spirit of rejection, and, and I, was, I couldn't talk in front of people. So I, I always felt like, wow, how I wish I have this sanguine personality where I step into the room, the whole room lights up, right? It's like everybody pays attention to me. But none of this. But you know, it doesn't really matter. And I want you to know the handicap came from God. Not from the devil, it's from God. Like Hannah. Why would God do such a thing? Now I want you to know that barrenness can be a curse, but it can be a blessing, a great blessing. Because it can be a precursor or a, a harbinger of a miraculous birth that will result to a great male or divinely chosen great male leader throughout the whole Bible, right? Samson, John the Baptist, uh, even Joseph for a long time. So <clears throat> a woman can get very desperate when she is barren. In fact, Rachel, all the matriarchs are all barren for a long time. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel came to Rachel. You imagine she was so desperate, she talked to the husband and says, can you imagine your wife saying, to give me children or I die? I mean, Jacob said, am I God? I mean, how in the world am I give you, give you children? And they were so desperate, they're willing to give up their maids to their husbands as surrogate mothers. Like, wow. So here was Hannah having this handicap in life. How, how would you respond? Now, she had every right to be bitter, right? I mean, God did this? Now, if it is the devil, I have every right to curse the devil, to rebuke the devil, but it is God. What can you do, right? You rebuke God, you, you cry. I mean, what can you do when you have this handicap in life and God intended it? Sometimes I thought, well, not sometimes, when I read the scriptures, I said, you caused Hannah to have all this misery? She had a broken family. She was already broken. The Bible says, she is broken. Bitterness of soul. Why? Because she was barren. And who did this? God did this. And I thought, didn't the Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. Good plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. And, and here was Hannah, suffering in great bitterness. And it was God's doing. I wouldn't blame her if she's bitter towards God, but she did not. Now, let's see how she responds to her handicap, and that's what we need to do. Hannah responded by praying. She responded, she poured out her sorrow to God. In bitterness of soul, Hannah match, uh, wept much. I think she cried so many times that there are no more tears to shed and prayed to the Lord. So you need to respond to your handicap by praying to God, pouring out your heart. Now, notice she is not bitter towards God. The bitterness of soul talks about brokenness. She was just so broken inside. I mean, most of the time, your spouse is your best friend. Isn't that, Pastor Sharon, right? And if your husband or your wife doesn't understand you, who are you going to talk to, right? The husband says, why are you crying? You're like, he has no clue. So who are you going to talk to? There is nobody to talk to. Where would you go? To God. So today you need to bring your handicap or whatever you feel like it was your handicap and talk to God about this. That's the only way. By talking about your, your misery and all that, it's not going to solve anything. In fact, it will complicate matters. Now let me tell you this. Whatever you think your handicap is, even if the handicap goes away, without God's help, it will mean nothing. Like for instance, I used to pastor a lot of Indonesians that have become illegal, out of status. So they say, I wish I have a green card, then life will be completely different. My luck, my, my destiny will be completely changed. I said, wrong. 
You see, you look around you, there are a lot of citizens of the United States. Now, not, not to bad mouth or anything, right? They have a citizenship. They can do whatever they want. Are their lives any better, you think, right? So I said, if you don't know God's will, you don't have God in your life, you can get a citizenship for all I care. Your life will be no better. Amen? So our life is not dependent. Well, you have a handicap. You think that was will be hindering you from moving forward in life. But God has a plan. And, and by the way, your handicap is not a curse. You may think it's a curse, but it is not. Because when Paul had a problem, he was sick or painful or whatever. He said, I prayed to the Lord three times to remove this. And God said, no, I'm not going to remove it. For in my weakness, my strength is made perfect. So in other words, your handicap may be the greatest blessing you ever have. Because through that handicap, God's power, God's mercy, God's grace will be extended to you. I remember early on this year, I have a colleague. I don't work for a mission organization. His son. His son is actually a very godly man because at the age of 18, he's debating, defending the gospel, and he has a Bible study. He leads people. He had an accident, motorcycle accident. He flipped and then had a concussion. And wow, serious. He was in Harborview for for several weeks, not knowing whether he will survive. But thank God he came out of coma and he's still recovering. A little bit uh, problem with his memory, but he's still recovering. Then we asked him, I said, how do you feel? He said, I will never trade this experience. The father said, this experience with anything else. Because in that time of sorrow and anxiety and pain, God revealed himself so real that I will never ever get to experience apart from this. So a tragedy in life is not necessarily a tragedy. It's a blessing in disguise, right? So your handicap is not from the devil. It's from God. Now how do you deal with this? Curse God and die like Job's wife said. Curse God and die because God doesn't care about you, obviously. God doesn't love you the way he says he does. Or like Hannah, in the bitterness of soul, just pour out to him and say, God, help me. Have mercy on me. And that's what he did. She did. She prayed to the Lord. She wept. And then she made a vow. She made a request, a promise to God. And by the way, don't... <laughs> I've seen too many people, when you are desperate, you make all kinds of promises to God. And when they come to pass, you don't fulfill that. The Bible says, it's better for you not to vow than the vow and not fulfill your vow. No, seriously, in the book of Ecclesiastes, right? He said, he takes no desire or delight in fools. Full. You are a fool if you make a vow and not fulfill it. That is what the Word of God says. So here is Hannah asking for a request, but make a vow. And this is one of the most unselfish prayer requests that I ever heard. She said, Oh Lord Almighty, if you only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, speaking in third person, that I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Look how respectful she is. There is no sign of bitterness or anger towards God, even though God caused this. God was behind all this and yet she was not angry towards God. But you said, Lord, in humble, in great humility, say, God, would you look upon my misery and grant me this or take away my reproach? Now, in my opinion, this is a very, very hard prayer. Because how many mothers would be willing that all your life you have waited for a son and a son is born only to be separated? Because when Hannah prayed this, the son will become a priest and will be separated from her all her life. And she get to meet her son only once a year growing up. Now, can you imagine? You have no children and all of a sudden, one boy came along and you have to give up. And that's what she said. I'm willing to give him up to serve as a priest separated from the mother and live away. Oh, that's the hardest thing for a mother, right? But she was willing for God's glory. In other words, she's not asking things for herself, for her enjoyment only, but for the glory of God. So today, if you're asking God to bless you with great riches, it's okay. God will be happy to do that. But are you willing to give back to the Lord what He deserves? Because a lot of times, statistics tells us the more people earn, the less they give in percentage-wise. Many people who are rich beyond what they needed, they give less than 10%. Because they thought, 
When I was earning $5,000, I give $500. Wow, now I have $5 million. <gasps> I have to give half a million. Oh, that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, you forgot that $5 million is a lot of money too, right? And many people, the more they earn, the less they give in terms of percentage. When they look, they can pride themselves, wow, look how much I give, half a million, you know, or one million, or, you know, you pride yourself in that, not knowing that God has actually blessed you more and you are not giving what you should give. So are you willing, when you, whatever you ask from God, are you willing to give it back, what He deserves? Something to think about, right? So He said, I'm willing to give my son to you. And then the Lord remembered. Wow, this is, this is a turning point, right? The Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived. Now, in the course of time, that means it didn't happen overnight. Maybe you make the vow, you make the promise, it might not happen tomorrow. In the course of time. So meaning that life went on, the attack continued. I mean, nothing has changed. Circumstances have not changed, but you continue on. And then God remembered, conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And Samuel is the Lord hears. The Lord hears. Wow. So whatever you ask for the Lord, it will come to pass. When? In the process of time. God continues to work on your character. And make sure we do not allow bitterness to come in. When bitterness, the Bible says, is a root of bitterness, right? And it can defile many. I asked my professor in college, I said, I said, Beware that any root of bitterness will grip you and will defile many, defile many. I said, what does that many means? defile many? Does it mean that many people got to be bitter and many means many people are de defiled? Or you get bitter and the people around you get defiled too? Which is it? And my professor said, both. <laughs> it's both. Many people are defiled because they have bitterness but not only defile themselves, but they defile other people, right? I mean, if you get and hang around bitter people, after a while, you get bitter too, right? Because all this spill out is anger, hatred, prejudice. And sometimes the people you don't know, but they talk about all these bad people have done things, you will begin to form an attitude towards those people, right? Even though you don't know them, but because of this bitterness. That's... But you know what? If you're bitter, it will pass down to your children. I mean, I realize that I'm angry at certain people because my mom was angry at them. And I thought, those people have nothing to do with me personally. But I was angry because my mom kept on talking, you know, about them, the influence, right? So make sure whatever, whatever bitterness you have, you need to get rid of it. If not, you will certainly pass it down to your children. That's a dangerous thing, right? We don't realize it. We don't want it to happen. But it is. My cousin, my, much older than me, she was assigned to take care of me when my father fell sick of brain cancer. They had to go overseas for treatment. So nobody was available to take care of me. She took care of me and she abused me. Boy, I mean, because at night, my mother taught me, yeah, that's another habit. My mom said, drink a lot of water before you sleep. Well, guess what? In the middle of the night, you have to go to the bathroom, right? So every night I have to go to the bathroom till now. And, and she would be upset that she would beat me. She would pinch me and all that. And then I realized that when she got her children, she abused, I mean, really beat up, you know. I mean, in Malaysia, there are no laws against children, but so beat up. I thought, oh. And I realized that she has been beaten up by her own mother. And I thought, if a, if a woman has been abused by her own mother, with, with, you know, Cain and all that, you would think you would not do it to their own children, right? But it's exactly what she's doing with her children. It just baffles me. You suffer this kind of injustice and pain. How could you do it to your own children? And that's exactly what she did. That you pass on whatever, right, that you get from your parents, if you're not careful, from parents to another generation. So here was Hannah asking, and God answered the prayer. But she never hesitated to give, give Samuel to the Lord. And Samuel was an incredible leader. She, he is, he, there was a transition, right, in the history of Israel. And he stood strong in the transition where he transitioned from the, the period of judges where there are no kings into the monarchs. And he stood there steadfastly. Incredible leader. Now, where do you think he got this heritage? Don't ever think that he grew up in the temple it was a great environment for him. In fact, it was a very toxic environment. 
Eli, the high priest, was getting old and getting blind, and he has lost control. The two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were scoundrels. I mean, they were robbers. They would rob people of their tithes and offerings. Before people even get to give to the Lord, they would just take the best part for themselves. And they will be committing adultery in the temple. Like, wow. And Samuel get to watch all this. I mean, imagine a little child with no mother, no father, and all these things going on. How do you think that he grew up to be such a strong, no scandals whatsoever? How do you think he could, he could have that kind of a heritage? It's from the mother. Okay. This is what she does. Every year, mother's responsibility for her children never stops. Those of you who are grandmothers, you know, right? Whenever your children have problems in their marriage, marriage or whatever, they come to you and you have to continue uh, to care for them. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took him to him and she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. The ephod is a priestly garment that a priest has to wear when he is performing his duties as a, as a priest. So Samuel, it's like, you know, in the Catholic Church where you have altar boys, right, helping the priests to prepare whatever, right? Were you one of the altar boys? Well, the Catholic, most people consider it a great privilege to be an altar boy to help the priest, right? So, so Eli is like the altar boy where he helps Eli to perform now. But in those days, when you, you enter in the presence of God, you need to wear the ephod. The mother will make it for him every year because... Eli, no, I mean, uh, Samuel would grow, right? So the ephod from last year is not good enough. Now, it's more than making a garment. It's like, oh, my son needs new clothes. It's not that. This is symbolically speaking that Hannah had a spiritual covering. The ephod talks about the spiritual covering for her son every year. And whenever she gets to meet with Samuel, she will pour out and remind her, reminded him, you know, that you are a, an answer to prayer. Don't ever depart from the ways of the on and on and on. And telling Samuel the reason why he exists is because God had a purpose. God answered the mother's prayer. So in other words, your prayer for your children will never cease. Forever you will continue to pray. And when you have grandchildren, you continue to pray for your grandchildren as well. And whatever words that you said is an impartation. Don't ever take it for granted because whatever you do for your children and grandchildren are forever. You don't have to re uh, leave behind a lot of wealth for them. But the spirituality, the legacy that you leave behind is great. So Hannah did great, produced a mighty giant that to today we are thankful. The, child the, the children of Israel, Israel was really thankful because of Samuel. Otherwise, he would never have existed. Now, <clears throat> this is how powerful the effect of Hannah's prayer and counsel, the impartation, all these years as a little boy growing up. And this is what the Bible says about Samuel. It said, <clears throat> And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, that's the borderline, from, from the top to the bottom, north to the south, Dan to Beersheba. So you read the Bible from Dan to Beersheba, it means all of Israel from the north to the south. Recognize that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. Wow. That is another way of saying whatever that came out of Samuel's mouth came to pass. And that is a very powerful statement, right? I mean, whatever he says came to pass. How do you think Samuel becomes so great? He grew up in a really terrible environment where adultery, robbery, dishonesty was rampant. And yet he turned out to be a stalling example. In fact, but when, what he saw with his brothers, right, Eli's son or uncles, whatever he, you call them, he would probably imitate, right, the dishonesty. But the Bible, to the end of his life, Samuel says, all my life I have served you. Anyone you can witness and testify against me that I have cheated you, say it now. Nobody can say it, you cheated. That means all this is as a prophet, not once he cheated. Not once people have a bad word to say you are dishonest. Can you imagine? Why? How do you think he can make that kind of a, of a testimony and such, such character produce? Oh, because of his mother. So you can do the same thing. Whatever you impart to your children, it's not too late. 
It's not too late. There is always an opportunity. At least your prayer can make the difference. So whatever you are sacrificing, especially those of you who are live in moms, let me, let me say this without offending anybody. Those of you who are working moms, fine. God bless you. And, and okay, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. But I'm just talking to the, the stay-at-home mom. Sometimes you feel like, wow, I'm sacrificing my life. I'm sacrificing putting my career on hold just for my children. Is that worth it? Absolutely. When I was starting out as a certified public accountant, the track of a, of a CPA is this. Zero to five years, you're a staff accountant. On the fifth year, you'll be considered a, a, a managerial position. From, from the sixth year to the tenth year, you're a manager. And after the tenth year, all the partners will consider you for partnership. Just like every lawyer, right? You're a lawyer, you don't want to work for people. You want to be a partner where your name you know, is stated in the office. So I have a manager who had a baby at about a year or two years old, and her 10 years is up, and she was considered, being considered as a partner. Well, that was a dream for every certified public accountant. And to my surprise, she turned down and she left. She quit. Her name was Peggy, I still remember. I said, Peggy, what? why? I mean, this is the dream of every certified public accountant. You have arrived. You are going to be considered as a partner. She said, yeah, that is very tempting, but during this time as a, as a CPA, during the tax season, I don't see my son at all. I wake up early in the morning, I leave by six, my son is still asleep. And when I come home late at night, he's asleep. So I never see him the whole period. He said, I don't have a lot of time with my son. I can always come back to practice my CPA, but I don't have all the time in the world with my son. And during this formative years, I want to be with my son. I thought, wow, chosen wisely. Recently, there's a girl. She's already working part-time four days a week. She wants to cut down to two days because she said, nobody is going to take care of my son. I said, you have chosen wisely. Now, again, those of you who are working, please, no condemnation. But I understand that those women who are making those sacrifices, I said, you have chosen very wisely and you won't regret it because you can work all the rest of your life, but your children, your boy, you have only one chance. At best, 10 years, even if shorter. You, you don't... Build yourself into that child for the first 10 years. When they grow in the teenage years, it's too late. It's too late. I have a friend who's a, a, a tycoon. Tycoon, a very rich person. And he moved his family to Singapore. And he has his business in Indonesia. So every weekend, he will go back to, to you know. So he said, I am a weekend husband and father. All these years when the, the girls grew up. And then when he was about to retire, he had all the money in the world. And he said, my girls only call me from America when they need money. That's the only time. And I thought, wow, too bad, right? He missed the opportunity. Now he's trying to buy back the affection with all the money in the world, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way because you have lost the time, the loss, whatever input. I still remember uh, Pastor Wendell Smith, the late Pastor Wendell Smith to Judah Smith, right? The only son. He said, I can just talk to Judah and he will respond. I don't use my hands and fists because now he's taller than me, he said. But they were young. I speak my authority. I will build my relationship when they grow up. Even though he's taller than me, I just speak and he will listen. I thought, wow, what, what a wise pastor, right? So you have a short time. So do the best that you can. Maybe put your whatever dreams and all that on hold and sacrifice for your children because that's golden. Because once they come out of it, it's, you don't build a relationship, probably you have lost it. But maybe you have your grandchildren now and, and just you know, build something into them. Like Timothy, the faith begins with your grandmother Lois and passed down to Eunice, your mother, and now lives in you. And you can have that dream and say, yes, it's not too late to build something in your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, whatever the case may be. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. No, not stand. The mothers. <laughs> the mothers. Please stand. I want to pray a prayer for you. Because today is this Mother's Day. Now, I pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus will be upon you to be like a Hannah. Now remember, Hannah doesn't have any special capabilities beyond her heart for God, right? I mean, she's not pretty, she's not rich, she's not even capable, and she's very submissive. Sometimes you feel like, Hannah, why don't you step up and fight for yourself? You have been bullied by a second wife. She has no right to do that. You are the first wife. You have every authority even to kick her out. But she never fought. She just said, God is... God is my judge. God, whatever injustice is done to me, God will be my judge. God will take revenge. I will not. Wow. 
Today, you can be Hannah, like Hannah, where you set your heart and says, I will devote my time to my children, to my grandchildren, to build something great in them. Father, I want to pray for every mother that are standing here today. Lord, your grace extends to each one of them. Lord, I want to pray for all these mothers that have stood. You understand their struggles. You understand their pains. And all the sacrifices they've made, and sometimes they are not made to be appreciated. Sometimes they may question and say, all this time they have spent and sacrificed for their children and for the family. <coughs> Is that worth it? But you can assure them today that they are doing it for you. Because all the children that you've given them, you're loaning the children to them so that they have the responsibility and the joy of bringing the children in the fear of God so that long after we are gone, they will continue the godly legacy. So today I pray for your grace upon each of these mothers that the spirit of Hannah, the heart of Hannah will come upon them, that they be prayerful mothers because the prayer of mothers are really effectual. And that, Lord, they will invest their time and build a godly legacy for their children and their grandchildren on many generations to come because that's the best inheritance we can give to their children. So bless all these mothers, encourage them. And whatever handicap that they may have, Lord, I pray that you will turn that handicap into a great blessing. May a great blessing come out of that handicap that in their weakness, your strength is made perfect. Bless all of them. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap.